I want to live until I die. People are asking me, Neil, when do you think you're going to retire? I have no idea when I'm going to retire. But I do know this. I will never retire from the Lord's work. I may be too feeble and too old to preach. I may lose my mind and not be able to remember the things that I remember. But I do know this. As long as I am alive, I am going to be serving the Lord. A lot of people that uh, were here the very first time I preached, it wasn't at this building, but at another building, they have either passed on or they have moved on. But if you have been here, well, if you were here the very first day that I preached for North Tampa Church of Christ, will you please stand? Let's give these people a hand. There is a special place in heaven for them because they have listened to me preach for 20 years. Now, I know this is going to be embarrassing, but if I am the only preacher you have ever been exposed to in terms of growing up in this church, will you please stand? I watch these two be born. Thank you, girls. It, it is just, I mean, there's just so many memories. There's memories of people that have passed. There's, there's memories of, of things that have happened. When I first started uh, 20 years ago, I was a young man. I was a young man. And I had lots of energy. And I remember them coming to me after I preached the first sermon, maybe a week or two afterwards, they said, Neil, we're really going to have to grow this church. And I said, yes, we are. He said, no, Neil, you don't understand. If we don't grow this church, we're not going to be able to pay you in six months. So I, that made me a highly motivated preacher. <laughs> but it, was, it has been a fantastic journey. I've gotten some notes from some friends. And uh, one of our elders, previous elders, sent me a, a text the other day. And it just warms my heart to know that I have spent 20 years and that you have become my family. And this is uh, is a great occasion. Now, for those of you who think I'm going to preach 20 more years, you're sadly mistaken. (laughs) I figure I've got about 10, maybe. Maybe a little bit more, depending on how the Lord blesses me. But I am looking forward to the next few years. But if you look at your sermon notes, it says 20 years, now what? What am I going to do now? Uh, after 20 years, how are things going to be different? Now, if you look at, or if you listen to the scripture reading, Paul says, not that I have already obtained this, but I have already, or that I've already been made perfect, but I press to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. There's three things that we've got to do from time to time. The very first thing that I think we need to do from time to time is we need to reflect. We just need to take a few moments to reflect. We are human beings, but most of the time we are just humans doing. And we get so busy with life, we get so caught up in our schedules and the things that are going on, we don't take time to really reflect and see where we are, where we're do- whether we're doing things right or whether we're doing things wrong. I heard a story about in in Brazil, they were going to build a road from one city to the other, and the only way to do it was to cut through the jungle. And so they're getting out there, and they're cutting through the jungle, and as they're cutting through the jungle, they're doing really good. So one guy says, hey, I'm going to climb up in the tree and see how much further we go, need to go. So he climbed up in the tree, and he looked out, and he yelled down, hey, we're going the wrong way. To which they responded, shut up, we're making good time. (laughs) And that's the way a lot of us live our lives. We don't take time to reflect on where we are and where we're going and what we need to do differently. Number two, we need to plan for the future. We need to plan for the future. I think sometimes uh, because of some scriptures that talks about uh, uh, the way that God plans our steps, Uh, that we make plans, but God decides our steps, 
those kinds of scriptures make us think that we plan and God laughs. And I think that's true. Because God has a plan. He knows where we're going. He determines our steps. But it doesn't mean we don't need to plan ahead. As, as a matter of fact, several years ago, when uh, Nancy and I uh, lived across the street from a Jewish synagogue, and they had to have somebody come in on Friday night to set the air conditioning and turn the lights on because they were very orthodox and you could not, a Jewish person could not turn on the lights or turn on the air conditioning in their building. So one, one Saturday morning, they came and they knocked on the door and they asked me, a Church of Christ preacher, would you come over and turn the lights on and turn the air conditioner on? Because I guess it was okay for me to sin. They just couldn't do it. And I went over and, of course, was glad to help them out. But you see, if they didn't plan, they wouldn't have had the lights on and they wouldn't have had the air conditioner on. What I always found very interesting about that is they couldn't turn a switch on, they couldn't turn the air on, but they could walk across the street and knock on a door. Made no sense to me whatsoever. But we got a plan. We've got to think about the future. The third thing is we need to put our house in order. We need to put our house in order. From time to time, we have to take our belongings and put everything up and put everything in order. Uh, I, I will never forget being with Glenn Presser before he passed. He, uh, his daughter was not uh, available, and he asked me to go with, his, with him to see his cancer doctor. And I knew things were not good from the way Glenn had been acting. And so I went with him because a lot of times when you're getting a diagnosis like that, you only hear parts of what a doctor says. And I told Glenn, let me go and let me listen as well so that you'll know what's going on and you'll be able to relay it to your daughter. And I'm in the doctor's office with him and the doctor looks at him and says, it's time to put your affairs in order. And folks, I don't know when I'm going to be leaving this earth. It may be next week, it may be 10 years, it may be 20 years from now, but I know that at some point I'm going to be leaving this earth and I need to have my affairs in order. And I'm not talking about financial affairs. I'm not talking about physical affairs. I need to have my spiritual affairs in order. I need to make sure that I am right with God and right with others. Now, if you look at your sermon notes, it says here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 16, Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I think it's very important for us to take time to reflect, take time for us to put our affairs in order, to plan for the future so that we can make the most of every opportunity. There was a preacher in the 1800s, his name was Charles Hayden Spurgeon. He was my dad's favorite author to read outside of the Church of Christ. And he was called the Prince of Preachers. And the reason was, is this was a very dedicated spiritual man, and he was a preacher's preacher, if you will. And he spent a lot of time writing and, and, and presenting lessons and things like that. But one of the things he did is he wrote a book called Faith Checkbook. And what it was, it was daily devotions that he wrote for himself, and then it was produced later on. And he wrote it from the perspective is that every day I only have 24 hours, and in each day I need to make it count. So when I write in my checkbook, I need to make sure that my day counts for something. So he wrote in June 22nd, he said, The truest lengthening of life is to live while we live, wasting no time but using every hour for its highest end, so, it, so be it this day. Well, in thinking of these things, I wanted to think about how is it I want to finish the rest of my life? How is it that I want to live the rest of my life? The days are coming that I am going to have to go before the judgment. The days are coming, no matter how young or how old you are, you're going to have to be before, come before the Lord. So how do you want to finish your life? How do you want to complete your life? Well, I put down seven things, and the first one is, I want to live until I die. 
I want to live until I die. People are asking me, well, Neil, when do you think you're going to retire? I have no idea when I'm going to retire. But I do know this. I will never retire from the Lord's work. I may be too feeble and too old to preach. I may lose my mind and not be able to remember the things that I remember. But I do know this. As long as I am alive, I am going to be serving the Lord. And that is the thing you've got to look at. So many people, I, I, my neighbor, I have a neighbor next door that did this. He retired. And all he does is watch TV. And he is waiting to die. And that is such a sad life. It is so sad to me that most of us spend our whole lives getting all we can. And then canning all we get. And then just sitting on our cans. <laughs> That's no way to live. Look, look at what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, the latter part of the verse. I have come that they may have life and they may have it to the full. If your life is not full, it's because you're going down the wrong path. Number two, I want to seek more truth or truth more than happiness. I want to seek truth more than happiness. The number one question among teenagers today is, why am I here? Why am I here? The number one question kids are asking today is, why am I here? Now, they, there's other questions that they're asking, but that is the number one question that they're asking. And the reason why they're asking that question it's because of the fact there is a truth out there that is greater than anything else that's important in this world. And when we can find that truth, then we will start to understand why I'm here. I grew up in a generation where we were trying to do our best. We were trying to get ahead. We were trying to keep up with the Joneses. But a lot of teens today have seen the futility of that. And they just want to know, well, why am I here? Because I watched my mom and dad get all these toys and have all this stuff, and they're still not happy. So it's not getting stuff that's going to make me happy. I watched my parents get all this education and have this great career and do all that, but they're still not happy. And it's because they have not sought the truth of God's Word. We have a purpose, and that purpose is in Jesus Christ. And we need to remember that because we need to seek truth more than happiness. Number three, I want to have more spiritual conversations. I want to have more spiritual conversations. I know you probably have forgotten, but to me, the greatest sermon series that I ever did was 40 Days of Love. And the reason why it was such a great sermon series in my mind, not because the preaching was so good, but the application that came from that for me changed who I am. I'm going out and, and I'm trying to make purposely every day, everybody I come in contact with, whether it's my neighbor, the waitress that's waiting on me, uh, the mailman, whoever it is that I come in contact with, I am trying to affirm them in some way. And it has play, paid such big dividends. I've got a young lady in Richmond, Virginia that will never forget me, I guarantee you. She waited on me and Tyler and Aaron. I just, I just poured into her and told her how wonderful she was. And she was. She was just a beautiful young lady, uh, bubbly. She had the best southern accent that I had ever heard. And I just poured into her, and she was telling me about taking care of her grandmother, who was from Alabama. And, of course, I just, just went on and on talking to her about things. But I can guarantee you she'll never forget me. But I'm going to tell you this. The people that I affirm, I also try to have a spiritual conversation with. And most of the time, as soon as I start talking about the Bible, or as soon as I talk about salvation, or as soon as I talk about any kind of spiritual matter whatsoever, the walls go up. But I don't care. Because all I'm required to do is plant a seed. And I love them. And I plant a seed, 
And I just let God give the increase. Because it may be somewhere down the road that somebody steps in and waters, and then God will take it from there. You see, it's not my responsibility to convert every single person I talk to. But it is my responsibility to share the gospel with everybody I come in contact with in some way or another. And it starts off by loving others. I will have to tell you, my son, when I was doing all this and pouring into this lady, he's just over shaking his head. <laughs> he's the same kid that said one night we were going to dinner. And I said, where do y'all want to go? And he says, Dad, I don't care, but can we go to some place that you don't know anybody? <laughs> and I said, well, no matter where we go, if I don't know him by the time I leave, I'm going to know somebody. That's my job. But anyway, the point being is, is you're not going to be successful, but you can con con continue to have spiritual conversations. It may very well be that you have that one chance to talk to that person. It may be you have a chance to talk to them daily. But at some point, as long as they know what's important to you, they're going to come to you when they need to hear more about spiritual conversations. Number four, I want to be more prayerful. And, and I'm talking about being intentional in my prayer. I, I know for years I would make plans and then I would pray. I would say, this is what I've got to do. And then I'd say, Lord, bless my plans. But what I'm doing now, what I've been doing here lately, is I've been more intentional. Lord, what is it that you want me to do next? How is it am I supposed to take this day and make the most of it? One of the things I want you to know that if you're a member of this church, and you're in our directory, and if you're a member, you are in our directory, whether you're watching online or whether you're here in person. But once a week, I take the directory out, and I pray over every family in that directory. And from time to time, God will put somebody in my heart that I contact and let them know, hey, I'm praying for you. And it's amazing to me how people will respond to that because of the fact that they're going through a hard time. You see, we've had a great series of lessons that Mark's taught on prayer. But I want to, I'm going to take next Wednesday, I'm going to take it to a different place next Wednesday. I'm going to talk to you about how God or why God doesn't answer your prayers. Mark taught you how to pray. I'm going to talk, talk to you about why God's not answering your prayers. And it's going to be a very interesting study. And if you're thinking in your head, well, God answers, always, uh, answers our prayers always. He either, excuse me, he either says yes, no, or maybe later. That is a great Church of Christ response, and we're not even going there. We're going to talk about why you're not connecting with God through prayer. Mark gave us the mechanics of it and how to do it and the different prayers, ways, ways to pray and how to pray in the Spirit and so forth. And we're going to take it a step further for two weeks. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, And pray in the Spirit on all occasion with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind. Be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Number five. I want to worship more. I want to worship. Worship is not just for Sundays. One of the things that I did before I started a lot of traveling here the last couple of months is um, I knew Nancy was going to be alone a lot during the day, and so I went and got a bird feeder. I figured the birds and the squirrels would keep her plenty of company because, you know, compared to me, that's really great. And, and we, we, we put the bird feeder right outside her, her office window, and she looks out and she looks at the birds, and from time to time, she'll come and tell me about the birds or the squirrels, whatever it is that's out there, and we have just really enjoyed that. She has especially. Now, I recognize cardinals, and I recognize blue jays, but Nancy has become an expert in birds. And she was telling me about a bird that comes around, and then she got in the truck this morning, and she said, this is the sound they make. And I thought, she has lost her mind. 
but she knows what kind of birds, where they come from, what's unusual about them, and she's just enjoying this so much. Well, yesterday I sat down on the couch next to her, and we were talking, and I was looking out the window, and I could see the bird feeder, and I could see the squirrels, and I could see the woodpecker come up, and I saw the red birds and the, the brown birds and the blue birds and everybody else that was around there doing all that. And Nancy and I were talking about that, and in that moment, I just worship because of God's creation and the fact that he blessed me enough to have the time to sit and watch his handiwork. You see, several years ago, I sat down with a young man who'd gone through a hard time, and he and I became close after one encounter. And that young man had a musical background. And I looked at that young man and I said, can you sing? And he says, well, I do karaoke. And I said, I want to make you a song leader. And he says, I've never led a song in my life. I teach instrumental music. And I said, well, we don't need that here. What we need is a song leader. And Jason Grantham took the challenge and he grew from it amen but the thing that I have loved about him and and the other song leaders here is that on Mondays and Tuesdays I'm still singing the songs that we sang from Sunday and, and if you say, well, I don't do that, Neil, I, you know, I, I only hear them once in a while. You know what Jason does? Jason puts the songs up every week so you can hear them before you come to worship. He usually has them out by Monday. And what we're going to be singing, you can sing all week. You can worship in your car on the way to work. You can worship when you're going out to eat and thank God for the, the food and the way he's provided for us. You can worship because you can see his handiwork. I, I, one of the places I traveled, I traveled with my good friend Bill. And we went out west and we were looking at all the landscapes and the mountains and the things that uh, were out west and went to the Grand Canyon. And I bet every hour or so one of us said, wow. Because we were in awe of God's handiwork. And we worshiped while we were on vacation. So, the psalmist says in 100, Psalm 100, verses 1 through 5, Shout for the joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter in his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good. And his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. The sixth thing that I want to do is I want to love like God loves me. I want to love like God loves me. And we, we, we talk about this in church and about loving others, and it's a great idea, but I got to tell you the practicality of loving others, people you don't know, people that don't look like you, people that don't smell like you, that's a difficult thing. And I was writing this in my sermon notes, and as I'm writing this, I decided it was, taking, it was time to take a break, and I got up, and uh, Nancy had the TV on, and there was a drag queen on TV. Middle of the day. First thought was, is why is Nancy watching a drag queen? But it was just a commercial, so she wasn't really watching it. But I looked at that, and I thought to myself, that's just disgusting. And then I went back to my office and I sat down and I went back to work and saw I'd written, I want to love others like God loves me. And it was like God was speaking to me. Because there's so many people that I find disgusting. 
that I need to have compassion for. We need to reach out with compassion, resist their agenda, but we need to recognize every person that we're disgusted by has probably been traumatized to get to where they are today. Several years ago, a young man in the youth group that I was a part of contacted me. He contacted the youth minister who I supported, and that youth minister turned into me, which I thought was an underhanded thing to do. But I was closer in travel time. And this young man had been arrested. And I said, what, what is it that you've done? He says, they're claiming I molested a child. And I said, did you do it? Oh, no, Neil, this is just all made up. They're out to get me. Went to trial. He was convicted. He was sentenced to prison. I started corresponding with him, and in one of the correspondence that I had with him, so I said, I'm going to come and see you, but you have to tell me the truth about what happened. And if I come and I see you and you don't tell me the truth about what happened, I will never come back to see you again. And I sent the letter, and a month later I went to see him. And we sat in the prison yard, and he told me everything that happened and he wept, and I wept, because he told me the same thing was done to him as a child by his father. I don't condone what he did. I am disgusted by what he did. But I have compassion for him because he was willing to admit the truth and he told me how he was traumatized he is out of prison now lives across the state calls me from time to time just to check in just to make sure that there's somebody on this earth that still loves him I may be disgusted by the behaviors of a drag queen or child molester. But if I'm going to love like God loves, I have to have compassion for even the worst of sinners. Luke chapter 6, verses 31 through 36. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. And underline these words because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. It's been interesting to watch the political movement that's been going on with gay rights and the things that are going on. And I'm telling you, we as Christians are going to have to start having compassion for those folks. We don't have to get sucked into their agenda. We don't have to agree with their lifestyle. But we need to be the ones that show them love more than anybody else in the world. Don't get sucked into their agenda, but show compassion. Learn to love like God has loved. Number seven, 
the last thing that I want to do is I want to relax more. And you say, well, it really looks that way, Neil. You've been traveling quite a bit. It looks like you're relaxing. Well, let me tell you, last week I dug ditches for my son. You tell me if that's relaxing. <laughs> what I mean by relax more is I want to quit thinking I'm in control of everything. I want to quit thinking that I can fix everything. I want to give it all to God and let God figure it out. It doesn't mean I'm going to quit working. It doesn't mean I'm not going to quit doing my best. But I am going to rest in that God has it all figured out. It doesn't matter whether it's my health. It doesn't matter whether it's my finances. It doesn't even matter if it's my future. God has it figured out and God will take care of me. And I just need to learn to relax in him. I love the words of Jesus here in your passage. It says, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I don't know where you are spiritually today. i sometimes not even sure where I am spiritually. But we have this tradition we do in the Churches of Christ where we sing an invitation song. And it's your chance to respond to the worship service today. Whether it's something you heard in a song, whether it's something you heard in the preaching or in the prayer, or if it's something that came to mind because of our communion service. Whatever it is, if you came in here today and you truly worshiped, you're going to leave a different person. And when you leave a different person, you're going to say, I need to change this in my life. I may need to change this in my life. I may need to be more loving. I may need to be more prayerful. For whatever it is that you need to change, if you worship today, you're going to go home different. There may be some here today that have never accepted the Lord's invitation to be baptized and be buried into Christ. And if you need to do that, we want to encourage you with this song. You may be here today and you may be thinking to yourself, this is a bunch of hogwash. I wish that guy would shut up so I can go home. And if that's where you are, we're going to sing this invitation song to encourage you too. And if you've been buried with Christ in baptism and you... Realize there's something publicly you need to repent of. Or you need the prayers of the church because you need strength and you need courage. You can do that publicly while we sing. But for most of us, it's the little changes we need to make. It, it may be a relationship we need to fix. It may be that we've been cutting trees and somebody's telling us we're going the wrong way. It may be that you just need to relax more. And today as we sing that invitation song, we want you to relax. Take God's yoke and put it on you. For he will take care of you. Whatever your need today, will you come as we stand and sing?